Welcome to the Tony Casillas Show. I'm your host, Tony Casillas, and you know what? I am so excited. We are back for our second season of our show, and you know, we all know about the pandemic over the last year and a half, but it seems like there's some normalcy going on, people getting vaccinated and just people doing things in general. It's great to see people get out and active, and uh, it's been a long year and a half. So I am so excited about my first guest. First of all, let me tell you this. Uh, if you like the show, if you're watching on Facebook Live, make sure you comment, like it, share it, our platform, because that's how we continue to grow. You can also subscribe to it on YouTube. Um, but we're so excited. We wanted to think about someone we could get on here that would just kick our show off and just knock it out of the park. And I am so proud uh, to announce and to introduce my first guest for my second season, first episode that would be the great, the GOAT, Troy Aikman. Absolutely. Good to be on, bud. So, you know, through this whole pandemic, uh, you know, I follow you on Instagram, and I think you you do a tremendous job of taking care of yourself and body and everything. But, you know, as we kind of get out of this and exit it somewhat with a little normalcy, what what kind of uh, perpetuated you through it? And what, what, you know, obviously, you know, working, you know, games during the football season. But beyond that, what kind of just kept you, you know, sane in this whole process? Uh, I, you know, I, Tony, I really think it was, uh, I mean, on the one hand, there, there were some silver linings. I mean, I, I was able to spend a lot more time with my girls, uh, because of the online stuff. Uh, so that part of it was nice, but I think like what you said, what, you know, I, I've, I've always tried to take care of myself. I've always worked out, uh, even after retirement, much like yourself. I know you keep after it as well. And, but when the pandemic hit, I, I just felt that people were going to go one of two ways and mostly one way. And that, and that was just kind of, you know, let themselves go a little bit and, and not be able to keep up with things as well as what they would like. And so I decided that, that I was going to uh, go the other way. And I, I got really ultra strict on my diet, uh, worked out uh, even more than I had been and started doing some of the little things, stretching and things of that nature that I hadn't done before. I recommitted. I, I'd always been uh, involved with meditation. It's It's been a, a big part of my life for, you know, really probably the last seven or eight years, but I'd gotten away from it a little bit. My practice wasn't as good. So I rededicated myself to that here over the last year and a half. And you know, quite honestly, I, you know, I'm reminded when I'm about to say this because Babe Loffenberg used to always tell me, you know, uh, you never hear players in their early (laughs) twenties say they're in the best shape of their life. You know, when you say you're in the best shape of your life, it really means you're you're getting up there in age, but I, I, I will tell you, I mean, I am getting up there in age, but it really is the best I've, I've ever felt physically and mentally and emotionally and everything else. So uh, that part of it, I guess, from that standpoint, the pandemic, uh, has gotten me to a, a, a better place. And, and for that, I'm grateful. Well, that's well said because I, I feel the same way when you're, when you're in the moment where an athlete, look, that's what you're supposed to do. But there's yeah. a lot to be said when you get older and you get in your fifties and you know, it's, it's, it's like the one thing that your family, your parents always told you, said, don't ever get in, in a hurry to get older. And then as you get older, you're telling the same thing to your your, your own kids. And you're yeah. like, hell, they were right about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, I, you know, I was talking with my, my girls just the other night at dinner. And my youngest just graduated from high school. And, uh, and I know you know what that's all about. But when, when you're a parent, you, you, the, the 18 years from birth to graduation, it goes by in a blink of an eye. When you're a kid, and we all, we all remember those days ourselves. Uh, it, 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 it's an eternity. And I said, you, you know, you won't really appreciate it until you have kids of your own, but man, it goes fast. And it's hard to believe that, you know, here I'm going to be an empty nester and, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, another phase of my life. Hey, there's nothing wrong with being an empty nester. Trust me. I no, am, I'm, it, you know what? I'm yeah. kind of looking forward to it, quite <laughs> honestly. I mean, it, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to miss the girls and, and all that, but absolutely, uh, it's, it's another stage and, uh, and, and, and one that, that I embrace and I'm excited about. Uh, and I mentioned, you know, the broadcasting. I, and I look back at your career and when you retired and you moved on and transitioned over to, with Fox into the broadcaster. And I'm sure you've people ask you this question before, time after time. But did you ever envision your 
your broadcasting career would last twice as long as your 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 tenure in the National Football League? I know. I I uh, it's I'm I can't believe that either. I mean, I'm going. I'm not. I'm not trying to age you or anything like that. I'm no, just I saying. know. I know. I mean, everybody knows <laughs> how old I am. And uh, but I, you know, Tony, when I first got into it, I, I thought I'd do it for a couple of years till I figured out really what I wanted to do with myself. And right. you know, here I am, my 21st season. But um, it it's it's been a great job. I mean, it's a, it really is a great occupation. I, I I told Jason Witten that when he was trying to figure out whether he wanted to continue to play or go into broadcasting. And when you have young kids, like, you know, my kids weren't born until after I retired. So uh, it afforded me an opportunity to really be available. I'm, you know, only being gone on the weekends, this was prior to taking on the Thursday night schedule as well, but only being gone on weekends and then being there during the week, being able to make all their events, driving them to school, picking them up, all of that. And then having the entire off season to be, you know, at, at, at their beck and call, uh, was, was really awesome for me, especially as a single dad for so many years. Yeah. And, and you mentioned broadcast. I know that you have to kind of transition with, you know, the, I, I would like a better word, see a society of uh, perception of social media and how, uh, I would say how effective it is and sensitive it can be at sometimes. As you move forward in the beginning, as you mentioned, your first two years in the broadcast into now, I mean, how sensitive do you have to be when you say something on there? I know there's, you know, there's been a couple of times where people were kind of is misconstrued, but how much does that come into your, your game plan as calling games and just saying anything because people are going to have this reaction? Yeah. Negative no, or a- positive? I mean, it's got to affect how you, you know, your, your, your delivery and what your thoughts are. Yeah, there's well, there's no doubt, uh, and and I think you probably experience that as well. I, I think anyone who uh, is in front of a microphone, uh, it, it's it, the, it's changed. I mean, the times have changed, and and you mentioned the social media front. Um, man, I'm glad I didn't try to break into this business with social media the way that it is today, because I was able to to make some mistakes, and not, not that any less people. Uh, knew of the mistake that you just the feedback to me wasn't that I was getting beat over the head about mistakes that I had made and so you know then you move along social media comes about and and I think that whether it's someone like uh, you and I or athletes I think you've got to be able to be pretty thick-skinned about it uh, keep it in perspective but then in terms of being able to I think the biggest thing that I've noticed here over the last few years is, is everyone is so sensitive about everything that you can't, you, you guard against even having any kind of fun because you're going to offend somebody. And that's sad, though, isn't it? Well, it really is. I mean, I, it, it just tells you that we're not where we, you know, it's not where we need to be. It's not where we should be. It's not where I think we want to be uh, as a country, as a people. I mean, I, I think we've taken a lot of steps backwards. I think there's a lot of a lot of good. There's some things that we've done that that are that are better for a lot of people. But overall, I think in the big scheme of things, man, the, the, that we can't. I mean, I've heard comedians talk about it. it it's re- it's really put a damper on their on their craft, and you know, they don't even know what they can. I say, mean, what content you know? are you going to use now, right? Yeah, it's going to be so, funny. <laughs> I had a line. I had a line last year. I, I won't say what I was about to say, but but I but I thought it was really funny, and I almost said it, and I didn't say it. Go ahead and, and say it. It's a podcast, is it? Well, then at, then at break, I asked Joe. I said, "Hey, Joe," I said, "I came this close to 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 saying this off of your comment," and he's like, "Yeah," he says, "I you know I, that wouldn't have gone over very well," and I'm thinking, "You got to be kidding me!" I mean. 10 years ago, it would have gone over really well. It would have been really funny. But now, you know, just that everyone is just hypersensitive about everything. So uh, it, it's it's taken a little bit of the joy, I guess, out of it that you pretty much just keep it down the middle of the road. Yeah, and, and you mentioned you know, athletes and social media. And, and, and it's how important – I mean, it's so important for their brand now, right? I mean, that's yeah. – they're they get four or five million followers – I mean, not only is that the brand, but along comes, you know, the monetary, uh, you know, the monetize, be able to monetize that. I mean, think about your career going back when we played with the, in, the, in the 90s with the Cowboys and the social media and everything out there. 
What would a guy like Troy Aikman been like? <laughs> <laughs> um, I probably would have had more followers than I have now. I know that, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's the true. popularity of the Cowboys, but, um, I don't know. I, I think that it's, I, I think that most of us would probably look back on our, our younger years and, and be grateful that, that social media wasn't prevalent like it is now and camera phones and, and all that. I think, you know, it's certainly, as you know, it's changed. I, I think the motivations in some ways for the athletes and for the, for the younger kids, but I also think it's, it's, it's been tougher on them and that they just can't be afforded to make many mistakes. You know, I mean, it's just all right out there for everybody to see. And I don't know that, I don't know that anyone, uh, you know, we're all quick to judge and, uh, we're all quick to be critical. I, I don't know that there's many people, uh, on the planet. If they look back on, on the mistakes that they've made in life and the, and the regrets and the decisions and that they wish they hadn't have made, I, I don't know that anybody can really stand up to some of the scrutiny that some of these young people are under today. Yeah, it's a lot of scrutiny, but uh, you know, one more thought on that. You know, it seems to me that while you want your cake and eat it as an athlete, a contemporary athlete, you want followers, it's hard for them to withstand the <laughs> the comments of maybe negativity or you know, a guy has a bad game and they're like, all of a sudden they're all sensitive about it. So it's almost yeah. like, well, why are you on since social media if you don't <laughs> want to hear the, the the bad or the negative things? Yeah, it's uh, you know, I hear a lot of people. We we've all said it. A lot of a lot of people say, well, they don't pay attention to you know what people say. I I I think that everyone wants to hear good things. You know, nobody likes hearing people say bad things about them. And but I think if you're going to be on that platform, uh, then you have to be. You know, you have to be able to accept the criticism as well. I mean, it's the it's the world we're in. I think as an athlete, you have to accept that if you're a professional athlete. Unfortunately, now college athletes and high school athletes are even under some of the same scrutiny that a professional athlete is, which I don't think is quite fair. But uh, it is it is unique that that players now it's really more of a it, it, I, I feel that there's not as much team chemistry as as maybe there once was. And some of that is because of the off-season rules and, and all that. The players aren't able to get together the way that you and I were and, and our teammates. Uh, but also, I, it seems that each guy is kind of a, a, an entity of his own. You know, and, the, and as you mentioned, they're, they're kind of selling their brand mm -hmm. and getting followers on social media or doing the endorsement deals or, or what have you. I, I think it's become – and that's not a criticism. I just think it's – I think it's harder – for teams and teammates to really come together and bond uh, the way that we did throughout training camp, the way we had training camp, the way we had off-season programs, guys worked out together. You know, now with the money that players are making, they've got they've got their own nutritionists, their own strength coaches. They're kind of they're they're they're, they're kind of on islands of their own, uh, which uh, which is all they've known. You know, but it is it is different from what you and I experienced. Yeah, it's definitely totally a different era when you <clears throat> excuse me when you look at that. Um, and you know, just uh, you know, one more you know one more take on that is is your experience as a broadcast. I always think this is a, a a good question that probably a lot of people wanna would like to ask you. Uh, and you've dealt with a lot of different athletes. Is there one guy that you just really just didn't? I, I would guess like bond with, or it, it was very reluctant to giving you information or, you know, during your interviews that the guy that you said, no, I don't really, really want to, it's not my, my guy, or I don't want to, it's not much fun, you know, talking to him or interviewing him. Um, you know, the only guy who at, at for a long time, there may have been an ass. Uh, I don't know. May, yeah. Well, it was just, uh, it was just not productive to be in a production meeting was, was Bill Belichick. I mean, we would, <laughs> we would, it wasn't a whole lot of, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be judgmental, but that doesn't surprise me. No, it, it wasn't a whole <laughs> lot. Unlike what, what, what you would see at a press conference, you know, that, that he would do for the country. And, uh, but yeah, so you get to a point where you just kind of, which is fine. I mean, they, 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 it's their prerogative as to whether or not they want to tell you anything, but 
um, you, you wind up carving time out and you go in and you talk to someone. And then if they don't tell you anything, you're kind of like, well, what, you know, what's the point then? And so we didn't talk to Bill for, uh, for a while, but then we had them, we had the Patriots in the Super Bowl back when they were playing Atlanta. And, uh, he was unbelievable. Uh, talked to him before that game. I mean, he was, he was so good. I, nice. you know, and I don't know really what happened, but since then, every time we have a Patriots game, you know, I talked to Bill and he could not be more forthright. Uh, tells me the game plan, what they're thinking, who they want to kind of go after. I mean, he's been awesome. So, but uh, no, I've never had, I've, I've been really fortunate that the, the players and the coaches and, and uh, the people that, that I've covered, they, they've all, now some, t- some are better than others. I mean, some give more information than others, but as far as just not getting along with them, uh, I've, I've never run into that. I've never had that situation. Well, that's good. I mean, obviously there, your, your rapport and the respect that people have for you, that, that goes a long way. Um, a, a, another question that's related to, cause I know that sometimes I like to get away from, you know, what you do every day and obviously that, but, um, I, I just got to ask you about Aaron Rodgers, and I'm sure people have asked you about that. Is that just kind of an enigma, what's going on with the, that whole organization at Green Bay and just this whole – this bad marriage going bad and no, nothing is going to be – seems like it's going to be reconciliated. How surprised are you about this whole drama with Aaron Rodgers and the Packers? Well, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, I, I think that, that Aaron's a unique person. I mean, I know Aaron well, and I have great respect for him and – you know, he's just, he, he's, he's just a different guy. And when I say different, I'm, what I mean by that is he's, he's got, he's got other interests. He's a really bright guy. You know, I mean, he's, he's just motivated, you know, he wants to win and win championships and all those things, but you know, he's just wired a little bit differently. I think that's why he's probably had the success that he's had. I, I thought it was, a, a little odd last year when they drafted Jordan Love with the needs that they had at the wide receiver position. And, and so I can understand. I know when Elway was at Denver, they, they drafted Tommy Maddox in the first round. And, you know, I never went through that with Dallas. But if you're a quarterback and you feel like you're playing at a high level or you still have years left and you look at the team and you feel that the team has needs and then they were to use a first-round pick on a quarterback – I, I can I can understand why that would cause some some frustration, but this past season, you know, talking with Aaron, we had a number of Packers games. He said he was in the best place that he had ever been mentally, mm-hmm. you know, and and he sounded like it. He was said he was having more fun than he had had. So, coming off of last year and the year that he had the MVP season, going back to the NFC Championship game, and then all of a sudden for it to just totally unwind the way that it has. That part of it does surprise me, but I, but there's no question, as you know, when they draft a guy in the first round, every organization, the thought is that, okay, well, this guy is going to play and he's going to be the starter at some point. And, and I don't know exactly what, what Aaron wants. Nobody does really. I mean, people think, well, he wants the general manager fired. Maybe that's the case. Maybe he wants a new contract. Maybe he wants, I, I don't know. And I, but what, what I know of Aaron, I mean, once he, once he locks in and, and hasn't, I mean, he doesn't budge. And so I, I, I seem to be in the minority. I don't think he's going to play for the Packers. I mean, is what, is what I think just based on what I know. And now that he's missing this mandatory camp, so we'll see how it all unfolds, but I do not expect them to play the 2021 season in Green Bay. Yeah, it's crazy to see this whole, you know, this the social media and just the kind of the fall of the story and where he's at. And and you're right, he's 38 years old. He's going to be 39 soon, right? I think he's 37 right oh, now. I'm sorry. I, I believe. Well, I, well, 30, I believe. But 37, 38 to think that. You know, when you look when you retired, and you have you know you have Tom Brady, you have Drew Brees, you have these quarterbacks playing in, in, up in their you know, 30s and 40s, and to think that you know in your in your early 30s, you're pretty much looking at the twilight of your career. You're getting ready to transition, and him, I mean, he's got jeopardy, he's got other things going on. I just think maybe him. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just him, man. Just like look, look, dude, I got more stuff going on. I don't really need you, you know. Yeah, 
Well, and, and now he's going to get married, so that'll really put the years on him. You know I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Damn, I've been married for 25 yeah, but, years, boy. There's some, there's some dog years in there, man. Well, hey, congratulations <laughs> to you on that. That's, that. To me, hey, I don't know what you think, but I'd say that's better than those two world championships you have. Oh, man. She's going to love those. That's why people love you so much, especially my yeah, wife. Well, <laughs> cause what you just said, and that's pretty cool. Well, I do think that's true. That's a, that's a real – because you got you to battle through it just like you did as an athlete. So congratulations. Oh, I appreciate that. That's awesome. Uh, and, and, and real quick, I'm going to stick, you know, we're going to move off to the, the football, but I, we look at the Cowboys and, and I'm sure you just, I don't know if you defend or you, you're, you're objective when your, your views as a broadcaster, which is tremendous. And it seems to me that you've gotten a little bit more, not opinionated, but it seems that your, that your voice has been a little bit more where it's, uh, where it's opinionated and you're being objective, if that's a good way to, to say it. Um, but when it comes to the Cowboys, how hard is it to defend them, you know, considering that you're a Hall of Famer and one of the, to me, arguably the best quarterback that's ever played for the Cowboys besides Roger Staubach. But to see the state of mind, how hard is it to defend what they're doing now? Um. Well, I, I'll be honest, Tony. I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't feel that I, that I need to be a critic, nor do I feel like I need to defend. You know what I'm saying? Right. I, I guess not defend, to, but, but just, yeah. uh, the, you know, not to be totally just, yeah. uh, well, you know, throw them under the bus. Yeah. I, uh, I just try to be honest, you know I mean? I just try to be honest in my opinions. And now that's not to say that every opinion that I have, whether it's the Cowboys or any other team that, that, that I air publicly, you know, I, I, I don't do that. And I don't think anyone does that, but, but I have thoughts and maybe with the Cowboys, some people feel that maybe I'm, I'm, I'm harder on the Cowboys than I am other clubs. And I, I don't feel that that's the case, but you know, I, I know more about the Cowboys than I do other teams. And uh, a lot of the same people, obviously the same ownership group and, and uh, the way things are done, the structure of the organization. So I definitely have opinions of that because I lived it. And, uh, and I know what, I know what some of our downfalls were. I know why we were successful in the nineties. I know why we weren't successful in the late nineties. And, and, uh, and, and so I think that my opinions come come from a, a place of experience and firsthand knowledge. And so, uh, you know, there are times when, when I would love, I would love to be the, the, the Roger Staubach that, and I love Roger. I mean, Roger's one of my dear friends. I think the world of him. And, and, but, you know, so Roger is always, uh, cheerleading for the Cowboys and which is awesome. And or like and Michael able, Irvin, Michael Irvin is the or, best you know, advocate. Michael, yeah. He's passionate. Yeah, and Michael can do that. He yeah. can do that from the seat that he sits in as a studio analyst, as a game analyst. You just, you can't do mm -hmm. that. I mean, people and fans don't really understand that fans think that they see Michael and, and they feel that, well, that's the way all former Cowboys are supposed to be, or the way Strahan is about the giants. And you can do that when you're a studio analyst, but you can't do that when you're a game analyst. And, and nor would I want to, you know, I mean, I, I, I want to call the game a, as I see it. And uh, so from that standpoint, uh, I, I, the thing is, Tony, that, that fans, when the Cowboys play another team, fans of the other team think that I'm a homer for the Cowboys. Cowboy fans think that I'm <laughs> anti-Dallas, you know, and Pat Summerall told me years ago, he said, uh, you know, as long as I'm getting criticism equally from both sides, then I'm effectively doing my job. And and that's, that's how I feel. And to go back, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier. You know, criticism is part of it. Uh, I think people hear what they want to hear, and I don't, I don't really pay much attention to it. Yeah. Uh, one thing they're going to be doing this summer is you're going to be presenting, uh, you know, uh, Jimmy Johnson into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, how surprised were you that he picked you? Because that's a huge honor, brother. And think about Huge it. I mean, that's how surprised were you whenever he decided he called and let you know that he wanted you to be the guy to present him? Yeah, I was uh, Tony. I you can't even imagine how surprised I was. I had a number of people, and I think it's because they saw my reaction on television when when it was announced he was going into the Hall of Fame, and and I was asked by a number of people, "Do you think Jimmy will pick you to be 
his presenter. And I said, no, heavens no. I said, Jimmy and I are close, but I said, I think it'll be one of four people. I, I thought it would be one of his two sons or his longtime attorney, uh, Nick Christian, or Terry Bradshaw, who he works with every weekend there on the Fox set. And, uh, and so when I was chosen to be the presenter, now he did choose, he chose Terry to, Terry Bradshaw is going to be the one who presents him with his gold jacket the okay. night before the ceremony. Okay. So. Jimmy said, Hey, I'd really like to have Terry do this. And I want you to then be my presenter. I said, great, Jimmy, this is all about you. So whatever you want is fine. And, uh, so I just actually did the, uh, I actually just did his video yesterday. They stopped having, uh, live comments from the presenter. Uh, so I did it yesterday, but yeah, he came up to me, um, when I was checking in, in Miami for our last Super Bowl that we had. And as soon as I was in the lobby, he had been waiting on me and he came up and he told me at that time. And I, I, I was, I was blown away, you know, I, and, and you said it's a huge honor and and I couldn't agree more with you. In fact, Tony, it's, it's the greatest honor Mm. I've ever received. I mean, and I, and I don't say that I, I don't, I I, I'm, I'm realistic when I say that I, I mean that it's, it's more meaningful to me than, than when I was selected to go into the pro football hall of fame and, Wow. And the reason is, is that if you, if you get selected to go into the hall of fame, you know, think about it. You can ask anyone you want, any person you mm-hmm. want to be your presenter. And so for someone to ask you to present them, uh, is, is a huge honor and it for it to be Jimmy, you know, who I, uh, who coached me, you know, the last time in 1993, uh, we've, we've obviously remained great friends working with Fox, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's the greatest honor ever. And I'm really humbled by it that he wanted me to do it. That's going to be great. So you mentioned you already, you just, you did the, uh, the video for the presentation, correct? Yep. You got any, anything you want to like tease real? That may, may well, the, no, but the, the, the one thing that, that I, I said was, you know, you think about it, Tony, that, I mean, this is going to be a great night. It's oh, going to be, it's going to be a great night for everybody that's going in, but, but just keeping it on, on the level of Jimmy, mm-hmm. this is a guy who a lot of players, uh, never got an opportunity to just thank him for what he meant to them or what he meant to, to our success. And the fans think about this, the fans have never had an opportunity to honor Jimmy and to show their appreciation for what he did for the team of the nineties and the way that he built that franchise, he hasn't gone into the ring of honor. He hasn't been honored at at Cowboy stadium at the old Texas stadium. And so now for the first time, he's going to go in at the highest level to the pro football hall of fame. And those fans will get a chance to, to really express uh, their appreciation for all that he did. And and I know that that's going to be a really really meaningful night for him. And, and that's what I'm most excited about. It's been, it's long overdue for Cowboy fans to be able to thank him and show their appreciation for him. It's a shame. It really is to me. It's a shame that it hasn't happened in Dallas. Uh, Why is that, Troy? I, I, I mean, is there, it, it's, it's backwards. I mean, he should already been in ring of honor, but why is there, if, if, if there is, any type of dissension or reason why Jerry wouldn't already had already had him in the, the, the ring of honor? Well, I think it's uh, probably uh, a continuation of why they split to begin with. Uh, back yeah, man, in that's been twenty. That's been twenty something years, man. Sometimes been a gotta, long time. That's you gotta, yeah, sometimes you got to bury the grudge or whatever. It's it been is. a long time, and I just think that uh, Jimmy. Obviously, there's not. There's no one. Uh, there's no one involved with those teams. There's no one really involved with football that wouldn't agree that Jimmy Johnson, Jimmy Johnson should be in the ring of honor and he will be in the ring of honor at some time. He's going to be in the ring of honor. My, my hope is that when that day comes and he is going into the ring of honor, I hope that he's alive and I hope that Jerry Jones is alive. And I hope that they're hugging each other on the 50 yard line when they drop the drape that has his name up in Cowboys stadium. That's what I hope for. Uh, whether or not that'll happen, I'm not real sure, but it's, uh, it's been long overdue. So I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad that Cowboys fans and Cowboys players and Cowboys staff and everyone else that will be there in Canton, Ohio, I'm glad they'll have an opportunity to, 
to express to him what he's meant to them because I know what he meant to me. And yeah, I know. But... A lot of there's a as you know, Tony. There's a lot of people that are responsible for what we were able to achieve, but I don't think anyone's more responsible than Jimmy Johnson. Yeah, you're right about that. Uh, does it bother him? You think because he's not in the Ring of Honor? Well, I think that I, I don't think it will now. I, I don't yeah. think it'll bother him now. I, I think that's I like think a footnote down, now. With the, yeah, I with, think deep down, I think that mm-hmm. Jimmy. I, I'm not sure Jimmy ever thought that he would get into the Hall of Fame. I, I didn't think he'd get into the Hall of Fame, not because I didn't feel he was deserving, just because uh, he hadn't he hadn't coached long enough. Uh, he hadn't won a hundred games as as an NFL head coach, and that was kind of the benchmark. So, uh, but he 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 got he retired. He went off to the Keys. He went and did his thing. So I I think that I think he thought the the his only real shot at having a legacy that outlasts him would be to go into the ring of honor but now that he's going into the pro football hall of fame I, i'm not sure the ring of honor it, it would I, I don't it would still mean a lot to him but i i don't think now that's as pressing of a desire as what it might have been prior and by the way i saw that that picture photo you guys uh down in key west out on his oh, boat. Yeah. that was pretty cool that's pretty special yeah it was a good group. You know, we all yeah. went down and, uh, you know, I was planning. It's a, this is the downside of the pandemic. Uh, it, no one even knew that I was going to do it, Tony. But, but I, had, uh, I had made plans. I was renting out Me Casino in Highland Park Village. And I was going to, it was just going to be a Cowboys event. It was going to be Cowboys players that were a part of the 92 and 93 season and coaches. And it was just going to be a chance to, to honor Jimmy because – when, when we all get to Canton, he's going to be pulled in so many different directions. That I told him, I said, Jimmy, nobody's going to really get the time with you that they would want. And this is an opportunity for, for guys to come in and, and just thank you for everything and, and, and you to be honored in a, in a very relaxed setting. And he was all for it. And so we were all set to do it last May. And Jimmy was ahead of himself, ahead of everyone. He was ahead of Dr. Fauci. He, he, uh, he, he called, he called me, he called me up before anything started getting closed down. And he said, Hey, Troy, I think maybe we ought to cancel this. I just hate for us to, you know, you to put money into this thing and not be able to have it and this and that. So we canceled and we wouldn't have been able to have it anyway. Well, the whole pandemic just messed up a lot of things. You know, it's good to see the, it's a normalcy. It's good to see you know, people going to, you know, events and, you know, people are doing things now. And it, and it yeah. just seems to me, obviously, that's going to, the, the, you know, the, the games this year, the different venues and stadiums throughout the, the country and the NFL, there's going to be full capacity fans. So that's going to be pretty cool. It'll be awesome. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it was different calling games without fans. And, and, you know, we had, we at least had the, the crowd noise pumped into our headsets. So, uh, but just the visual uh, was odd. I don't know how the players did it because they didn't have that pumped into their headsets. You know, I mean, so they they they're out there literally playing when it's pretty quiet. But obviously, the, the Cowboys didn't it, have it pumped in there. You know, last no, year it was kind of no. They, and they, <laughs> kinda... they yeah, they had. <laughs> and, but the good thing about it, Tony, was we were able to get in and out of those stadiums. There was no traffic. I mean, we were you know, especially Thursday night games. Sometimes it's pretty brutal on a work night fighting the rush hour traffic to get in and out of these stadiums. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't see anybody. We got in, got out, you know, got to the airport, got on our flights, got home and, and all that. But uh, with all that said, I'd much rather be fighting traffic and have fans at the games uh, than, than go through another year like we did last year. All right. Well, I, I really, again, I appreciate you, you hopping on here with me. Uh, I, I, real quick and, and just related to Cowboys, I'm, I'm sure you answer this question all the time, but – you know, after that dismal season last year, people just want to forget. It was just, uh, just it was just inexplicable what happened on the defensive side of the ball and then offensively when Dak got injured. I mean, how do you see this team moving forward? I know you're obviously a big fan of Dak Prescott and what they right. can do offensively, but now this seems to me, and, and you and you know this, that defensively you have to you have to be able to get stops. You have to be able to. Yeah keep the, the, the complement each other. And last year they compromised each other. But as a whole, and what you've seen to this point, and everybody has high expectations, give me a real quick synopsis of what you think about this team can do this year. What do you think the, the top and the, the, the bottom and top of this team as far as potential what they can do this year? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, it, it seems like we are probably, uh, by and large, 
overly optimistic about, about the Cowboys each and every year. Uh, Cowboys fans and those of us in Dallas, as opposed to what maybe people around the league think and how they perceive the Cowboys from one year to the next. But I, I don't think it's as simple as just saying, well, Dak's going to be back. He's healthy. So now, now they're off and running. Uh, I, I, I believe that, you know, this offensive line, uh, they're healthy right now in, in June. Uh, but can they remain healthy when they start having to be more physical is, is, is a real question. Uh, as to whether or not they're going to continue to be good. They, they've got all the pieces, as you said, that they should be an explosive offense. And if they don't turn the ball over, they were that, even though they lost games when Dak was healthy last year, it was more about the turnovers than it was just not having an ability to move the football. On, on defense, I mean, you know this better than I do. I, I think uh, there's if you have a mentality – of being aggressive, being physical, and flying around to the football, I, I think you have a chance to be a good defensive unit. And then if you're talented on top of that, then you have a chance to be a great defensive unit. And I, I like Dan Quinn. Uh, I do think that last year, and it was really – unfortunately, Mike Nolan, he, he kind of fell on the sword for their failures. Uh, but – the the intent, which was handed down by McCarthy, was that they wanted to be multiple in what they were doing, and so that's what they tried to do. And the players just weren't, for whatever reasons, whether it just wasn't coached well enough, or whether they just couldn't absorb it, whatever it might have been, uh, they just they made way too many mistakes. And so there's no question that the style in which Dan Quinn plays defensively it will simplify things. Guys will know where they're supposed to be, what they're supposed to do. And hopefully that'll allow them to play faster. And then some of these young players with another year under their belt, uh, they'll play better. But th to, to when, you, when you've lost the way that they lost last year, it, I, I think you have to kind of learn how to win again. I mean, you have to kind of come together and you work through that and win some games early and slowly start to build your confidence back up is the way that I believe that it happens. And I, like I was saying earlier, I just don't know how all that comes together with so little time in the offseason. Now, everybody does that. And I think the good thing is for Dallas that unlike a lot of other teams, they've got a lot of players that are there during their voluntary workouts. So that's that gives them a leg up. But they should be a good football team. And it seems like I'm t saying that each and every year. And then <laughs> it doesn't always happen. Hey, we're so, all, we're all know, saying that. Yeah. Seems like that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> Yeah, oh, it's a narrative, so right? Hopefully, it happens. Yeah. All right. So, on my show, we do a couple of segments with my guests. The first one is X's and O's. We're excited to now, starting this week, that X's and O's will be brought to you by Dr. Matt Chalmers of Chalmers Wellness in Frisco, Texas. So, I'm going to ask you a couple, a couple of questions. Um, it's more life skill related. What's going on? And, you know, nothing. It's really personal. No, I'm just kidding. All right. All right. First of all, <laughs> um, you mentioned you, you like to travel, right? Yeah. So yeah. if is, if there's a, one place that you could go and travel to that you haven't been to, but it's on your list to go, go to, what destination would it be? Well, the, the one that comes to mind right away is Bora Bora. Uh, I was just I was just talking about that place, and it's a place that I've I've wanted to go. Uh, I've also heard a lot about New Zealand. You know, I first heard about it years ago. I was still playing. It's how far back it goes. Norm Hitchkiss was the first one who told me about. He says you got to make a trip to New Zealand sometime. And since then, he's gone several more times, and he he's told me as well. And then others have said the same thing. So that's another spot I'd like to go. That's one of the things that. You know, I've really gotten into photography, and uh, and I have I've I've always been somewhat of a frustrated photographer going back when I was quite young. Oh, really? Now when, did, when did that start? Well, my mom back when I was a kid, you know, she was one of the first people that I knew uh, to get a thirty-five millimeter camera. She got a Canon camera when it first came out, in thirty-five millimeter, and so I, I was kind of interested at that time. And you know, a lot of kids back in the day, our age, they didn't, you know, they're they didn't have a ton of pictures of themselves when they were kids. I I've got a lot because my mom was an enthusiast with the camera, you know, that our heads weren't always in the shot, but, uh, but our bodies. Were, yeah. The Polaroid know, I mean. was our, was our, was our smartphone <laughs> back right. then, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, I've taken classes. I've taken online courses. I've taken classes in person. I, I've done a lot. And so really what I'd like to do, Tony, uh, now that now that I am uh, going to be an empty nester or am an empty nester, uh, is I'd really love to travel around. I follow a lot of photographers on Instagram and uh, go to remote places, great places, and just uh, do photography. And uh, so those are the places I'd kind of like to go. I, I, where I have been, I've been to Africa now twice. And done a couple of safaris, and and man, that th those safaris that I've done and the trips to Africa have been the best trips that that I've ever taken. I mean, awesome. I, I would go every year um, if I could, and 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 maybe I can. I don't know, but I love it over there. So you see, like really you've great. been on safari, and the, I think I've seen that on your Instagram. So you've you've been out there in in the element where you're seeing yeah. lions and elephants yeah. and. I mean, how fast yep. is that? I've always, it's, it seems so majestic to see all that stuff, Oh, it's, man. it's, uh, it, you know, you, it's kind of an overused term. You know, people say, Hey, it's life changing, but this really was, I mean, it is, it truly is life changing. It's just, uh, it's a magical place, you know, to be able to go and see, you know, and the thing about it is these animals, they, they, they've all, they, they've all been raised around vehicles driving around. And so, you, you know, you're, you're, you're pretty safe when you first go and you don't really, you're not <laughs> used to it. I remember the first trip. I mean, the, our first time out in the safari, we, we came up on, on a lion and it, it walked, I mean, literally brushed up against our vehicle and I was scared to death. I mean, I was like, Oh my God, my heart stopped. You know, I thought, <laughs> man, I'd have to change well, my then, pants on that one. Oh, it's, 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 <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, I, if you get a chance to go sometime, you should go. I don't know if you've done this before. Have you ever been to Alaska? I've not. Have you ever been I, salmon fishing? I mean, I've always like on these weekend. Let me just tell you, go to Kenai, Alaska, and, and and go get you a fishing guide and go salmon fishing on the Kenai River. There is nothing like it, especially like in July, whenever it's there's yeah know, there's eighteen hours of daylight. Dude, I tell you what's the best place you'll you, you, uh, and do the I glacier to, the glacier flyover. The glacier fly yeah. over, I tell you what, man, you're talking about majestic and serene, man. It's amazing. I'd love to. I'd love to. That's another good spot, yeah. Yeah, you should try that. I uh, you mentioned Mikosina. we know that restaurant. So I'm gonna ask you what's yeah. your what's your what's your favorite your beverage of choice? Margarita, wine or 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 beer? Uh I would say beer. Really? Um, yeah, I'm not a uh, I'm not a big drinker, but and, and even less so here in the last year and a half. But but yeah, I would say uh, I'd I'd say cerveza. The what you know, so cerveza, cerveza, por favor. Yeah, did I did I say that right? <laughs> oh, you're right. Well, you're very, looking at me, Spanish man. You expect me good. to like that fluent Spanish, well, right? I was waiting for you to I was uh, correct you? you to affirm affirm <laughs> my pronunciation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you did pretty good. I uh, you, you mentioned you know, if I said that on the air, I'd get canceled. You know, I mean, it, I, I, I'd doesn't that suck, man? I mean, really, think yeah. about it. I mean, it really does. Hey, and, yeah. and, 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 and to that point, remember how much fun? Well, none, of, none of those people have ever been in a locker room. I mean, That's all I'm imagine? saying. <laughs> so, what do you say in a locker room now? If you're, well, if you're, if you're I hope. I, that hope? I, my, my my hope is that the locker room is 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 sacred ground. I mean, I hope that the I locker hope room so. has changed. Yeah, I, I mean, hope so. Hopefully, there's not HR in there because we know that that's yeah, I, you know, I, a bit tremendous my, problem. My guess is you probably agree, Tony. I mean, the, 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 there's nothing that takes away from from the victories and the accomplishments on the football field. But man, when you get away from the actual game itself and the the time in the locker room, I mean that. Those are cherished moments, you know, and that was a lot of fun. And I think all athletes, when they retire, that's what they miss most is those lighthearted moments within the locker room. And, and there's a real kinship and a bond that, that occurs. And that's what, you know, everybody says it, and it's so true that our politicians and, and uh, everyone could really learn if they, if they went into a locker room and see how, you know, 45, 50 guys from all different backgrounds come in. And not, not only do they get along because they have a common objective, but they, but they also have fun at each other's expense and nobody takes it personal and everybody laughs about it because they know everybody cares about one another. And I think that's, I think that's something that everybody could learn from. That's pretty good perspective. If you think about it, people having to deal with yeah. different and, and just not taking each other serious too. I think yeah. that's what we do now is like, there's so much, you know, I don't know if it's a pandemic and how 
you know, it's kind of like when you watch the basketball, you know, all the fans acting up, and which is you should never do that. But still, it's it, we we just can't laugh at each other anymore. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. uh, it, it's kind of and 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 and. And the last one, Lisa, is part of this uh, X's and O's. You're a big you, you, a guy that takes care of yourself. I mean, I you know I, I still want to make you that challenge on Peloton because I think I, can, <laughs> you know, it's the only thing low impact thing I think I still got left, and I'm going to get that challenge from you one time. We need to do it. Just to, <laughs> and I don't want I don't want to embarrass you, brother. I mean, you know, I, and I need to follow you on uh, you know I follow you on Peloton. But um, as far as we talked about getting older and just the perspective we have, but and you look great. But but what kind of advice you get for people as far as living a better life, as far as taking care of yourself? And you mentioned yoga, peace of mind, and everything. But what advice could you give people that are really looking to that kind of serenity when it comes to calmness? Yeah, you know, I get a lot of people asking me. It's why I've started posting some of it on on my Instagram. Feed. I love it, by uh, the way, too. I mean, people, they need to follow you because it's a, you're a great follower. Well, I appreciate it. You know, a great follow is Mark Hyman, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Mark Hyman, H-Y-M-A-N. And uh, I've read a couple of his books, and it really has helped me here in the last year. And a lot of the things, I, I, I felt that I knew a lot about nutrition and the, and the proper diet, but he, he, he dispelled some myths. Um, and so it's, it's helped me. But I, I think the key, I mean, the, the, the choices that we are making now or that we were making when we were in our 20s and 30s, you know, this is the time that they start to pay dividends for us, especially as we continue to age from this point forward. And so I would just encourage people to avoid processed foods, eat whole foods. Um, if you just did that, eliminate as much sugar as you can in processed foods. If you, if you did that, I think you would notice a huge difference. I've got a, uh, I started drinking this about two and a half, three years ago. It's a gallon of water and I carry it around with me everywhere I go. And, uh, uh, and drinking, I drink about a gallon and a half to two gallons a day. And it, that also has made a huge difference for me. I, I mean, I've noticed my sleep is better. My digestion's better. My skin's better. I feel better. Uh, and then just being active. Um, you know, sometimes I think, and you're probably the same way. Sometimes I think that maybe I, I overtrain a little bit. Yeah. Sometimes I'm a little more sore than mm -hmm. I probably should be. Uh, I try to do things to minimize in inflammation as much as possible, but, uh, just get out and move, whether that's walks, uh, whether it's yoga, whether it's running, you know, whatever it might be, being active, being active, eating properly, and then making sure, uh, drinking plenty of water, making sure you get, I making sure you're getting plenty of sleep. I, I, I finally got to where, um, now if I have to get up early for some reason and I'm worried that I might oversleep, I'll set an alarm. Right. Otherwise I don't set, I'm up, at, I'm up about six, six thirty uh, most mornings, but Are I you a coffee drinker. Early. Uh, I do, I do drink, uh, I do drink coffee, not a lot, but Man, I'll have I two love to three coffee. cups. Uh, that's, yeah, yeah, I'll that's have fine. two to three cups in the mornings. Um, some people say it's, it's not, it's, uh, that's okay for you. Others I've seen where they they'd encourage not to, not to drink coffee, but yeah, there's always um, those I, I just, those are the things that yeah. I do, Tony. And, and, uh, and I think that they've really helped me a lot. And I, I think that they'd be game changers for those that they haven't uh, incorporated those things into their own lives. All right. Our last segment is Ben's worthy. Now I've seen you on Instagram. You posted pictures of like F1 and racing or formula racing. And we know through this whole last year and a half, we've gone to, you know, programming when it comes to netflix with hulu whatever it may be but what's something ben's worthy something that you're on that you recommend to our to our viewers well f1 is uh is one of them i didn't realize it's been out i think longer than what i realized i thought it was kind of a relatively new docuseries but um i, I had it had been recommended to me by a friend and then another friend asked if i'd seen it and i said no i haven't seen it. so i started in on it and I'm, I'm obsessed i really didn't know anything about formula one racing but now I'm, I'm i've learned a lot and now i'm i find myself uh becoming a fan to where i want to i want to now go to some races so i i would highly recommend that uh i i i i've gotten into uh the office uh obviously an oh, old great. an old show yeah. but I've, I've started binge watching the yeah. office and you know, talk about some things that couldn't be said in today's television. I mean, it's like, holy smokes. It's kind of refreshing, I mean, I though, to watch, though, isn't it? Yeah, oh, my God. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, mean, I don't like, know. Maybe man, some things, is, maybe. <laughs> it's, it's just, it, you know, it's just funny. 
And uh, and so I've, I've kind of enjoyed it. But some of those episodes, some of those things that I've heard, I've just thought, man, I, is that really is that really happening? Did they just say that we, or did they just do? We've all been conditioned that you just can't talk like that anymore. So I think that's what probably uh, makes it even funnier. That's funny. That's kind of the form of profanity now, unfortunately, right? That's right. Yeah. Hey, well, hey, Troy, I cannot thank you enough for being on my show. And I've told you this uh, many times, but I appreciate all the years. Appreciate what you're doing. Appreciate you helping out your football brother. Seems like you're always there. And, uh, I, again, I can't thank you enough. Thanks for hopping on, man. Appreciate it. Tony, means a lot, buddy. Hey, I, uh, I appreciate you. I'm proud of you, you know, what you're doing. And, uh, and I, see the, I see you getting your workouts in and stuff, too. I mean, you're, you're a great example for a lot of guys, uh, and I mean that, that that especially guys who played offensive or defensive lines, you know, I mean, those are tough positions and to be able to keep the weight off and work out the way that you have, it's, I know that is, is inspiring a, a lot of, of our former teammates and others that, you know, uh, so thank you for that. And, uh, I love you, buddy. And I look forward to seeing you in Canton. And I look forward to that Peloton challenge. Okay. You know what we should do, Tony? We should, we should do that. And we should gather as many probably teammates as we can and we should do something like that and just uh, see if we can't raise some money. That's a great for, idea. I'll take advantage of you on that. Definitely. Yeah, I know you just did that deal for Bear, uh, the OU. Yeah, uh, that was good. At, at Billy Bob's. Yeah. Shop. Maybe we can do something like that for some, uh, for some less fortunate teammates of ours. Hey, I appreciate it, Troy. You're the best, man. Love you, brother. Love you, buddy. Right, take, take care. care. Take care. And look, I'm going to take Troy up on that challenge on the Peloton. I think it's a great idea that we raise money for – my fallen brothers that I played football with and their families. And so I'm going to take him up on that and I'm going to get more guys engaged and raise a lot of money and I'm going to win. I'm going to win. But anyway, it's a great, powerful interview. Thanks for him being uh, with, with me again on, on the show. And I want to thank you guys for tuning in and I hope you continue to follow us. As I mentioned, the first of the show, uh, if you like the show, like us on Facebook, you can also subscribe on YouTube, the Tony can see show. And can't wait to see you next week. As always, have a great week and mucho te amo.